Um, thank you all for coming. It's a great pleasure to be in Hyderabad and fresh from the Jaipur Literary Festival. We have our panel. Fresh is perhaps not the right word because they got up at three o'clock in the morning, but they're here anyway. Um, and uh, just so we know who's who in, in, in this uh, assembly, we have uh, Anna on my left and Marika in the middle and Jane on my far left. So as you heard, there's a wide variety of expertise across various modes of writing and various uh, mechanics of publish, uh, getting published, uh, and we'll explore that very soon. Now, one of the things that is a curiosity of uh, colonial publishing is that there still remains a little bit of a barrier in the rights negotiations between places like India and Australia and it's actually often hard to get books both ways. So I thought I would just give you a little outline before we get into the nitty gritty of, uh, of detail that Australia is just coming up to about 25 million, so total population. So you compare that to the Indian situation. You see the book market is slightly different in that sense. Um, but in that regard, we have about 4,000 total publishers, of which 26 of the major ones, uh, and we publish about 20,000 titles of books each year. So it's an active publication market, even though people always keep talking about the decline of reading. Uh, it's, we, we are still in the mix. Um, but the sort of writers you might hear about, I've been coming particularly to Calcutta a few years, uh, keeping my eye on the bookshops, and. Uh, the one book that is always there is something called Shantaram. <laughs> Anyone know that one? Yeah, okay, some people read it. It's a sort of, depending on whether you believe it, it's either true crime or, or crime fiction, um, but a, a popular big novel. Obviously, the biography of Shane Warne is uh, on the bookshelves. Uh, Peter Carey is there. Tom Keneally is often there. The Booker Prize winners. Uh, and interestingly, Garth Nix. We had a panel on young adult writing earlier. Garth Nix is one of our major exports in young adult fantasy writing. Um, also, I noticed on this bookstore the other day, uh, Marcus Zusak's The Book Thief. Uh, and uh, Marcus is a, now one of the, a globally popular uh, writer. He's just put out a new book. So just books do manage to you know, percolate a, a, across uh, the Indian Ocean. Uh, both ways, in fact, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. But I thought we could start off um, by thinking about books you might like to keep your eyes open for. So a couple of books that each person uh, thought were of were worthy of notice across the last year. So I'll, I'll st we'll start on my left and go through to Jane. Hi everyone, it's uh, fantastic to be here. Thank you for coming along. Um, I run the Australian Short Story Festival, so I thought I would talk about a couple of um, short story collections that have come out of Australia in the last few years. Um, one is by um, an Indian-Australian writer called Rowana Gonsalves. And uh, in Australia, the book is called the permanent resident, but um, it's been published here by Speaking Tiger and is called um, Sunita D'Souza Goes to Sydney, I think. And uh, it's just an absolutely wonderful collection of stories all about Indians who have migrated to Australia and, and the issues they face um, in terms of uh, within the community and there it's a Catholic Indian community, um, Rowanas from Goa, and I mean, I was just totally blown away by how she'd written it so insightful about relationships and sex and, um, you know, hardship, but also joyous and lots of laughter. It's funny. Uh, so, I mean, that's certainly one I think you should look out for, and um, I know that she would love to come to the festival as well, if the, I mean, festival people are here. Um, and then there are another couple of, it's, it's funny actually when I was thinking about this question, um, all the writers that came to me were um, diverse voices. So Melanie Cheng is another um, Australian writer who has um, 
background, she has a Chinese background, and she writes about all sorts of different Australian backgrounds. Her characters are very um, wide variety of characters, and she writes really insightfully about their lives in Australia. And another one that I thought of was um, Tony Birch, who's an Indigenous First Nations writer in Australia, and his collection called um, Common People is really excellent collection. He writes from inside all kinds of different people and um, you know young women and, and their struggles and it just there's a lot of empathy in the writing which I really enjoy as a short story reader I want to feel like I'm inside these people and uh, the last one I wanted to mention was Julie Coe who's um, also an Australian Chinese writer and, and she writes um, kind of slightly fantastical stories like fantasy but also very very funny stories and I'm not sure if any of the others are available in India but certainly um, Roana Gonsalves short story collection is so keep an eye out for that one um, so I'm the uh, as was mentioned the artistic director of the Melbourne Writers Festival which is a 10-day event in Melbourne uh, last year we had 400 events and 500 writers in the 10 days and we're just in the cycle now where we're starting to book international and national authors for the 2019 festival, which means a big part of my job is being sent books by publishers and reading them, which is a huge joy, and then seeing how these people might work in a festival context, and it's the beautiful jigsaw of figuring out which genres you can have as a mix. Um, and so I guess I wanted to talk about books, two authors that were featured in the festival last year who had 2018 releases, uh, a young writer called Jessie Cole who wrote a memoir called Staying which was about um, the death of her father and sister. She grew up in a house and her father had a lot of mental health issues and after he passes she ends up staying in the house in a very small community in rural New South Wales and what it is to stay in a small community when a sense of tragedy might be a part of you and everyone around you uh, it's a really beautifully written book. Um, she's done quite a lot of talking about it. There's a lot of catharsis for her, I think, in writing the book and being able to tour it. Uh, and she did a really beautiful event with us last year. And the book that was a kind of sleeper hit of 2018 in Melbourne, but I think it's just been sold in the US, um, there's a, it's a book of essays about trauma called Axiomatic by a writer named Maria Tamarkin. And this book, there's a very small independent uh, publisher house called The Lifted Brow in Melbourne, and they are making some incredible choices with publishing. Uh, Maria Tamarkin's Axiomatic just won the Melbourne Prize for Literature last year, which is a $30,000 prize. Um, it's, it's an incredible piece of writing. It's, it took her five years to write the book. It was a huge labor of love. It's a very intense book, but it's unlike anything I've ever read and it's extraordinary and I think it's getting this it's very nice to see a book have that sort of impact not only on the literary community because everyone was passing it around amongst themselves but the fact that it's now selling and it's winning awards and it's being sold overseas so it's really exciting to see a writer like Maria get that sort of recognition. I was actually going to mention the Rowena Gonzalez book as well. Um, because I know it's available here in India, but as Anna said, it's an incredibly insightful and incredibly funny book. It makes you laugh out loud. But I agree with all the other short story collections, and I, I think there really is a, a wellspring of excellent short stories coming up in Australia. It's like a revival of the short story. Um, yeah, yeah, and Anna thinks they were always there probably, but, <laughs> um, and they were, but there does seem to be a particularly excellent crop of them at the moment. Um, because I write about science and direct a science writing festival, I thought I'd mention a science book. Um, and my favourite Australian science book of the last 12 months or so um, has been Anesthesia by Kate Cole Adams, who's a Melbourne journalist. And she spent something like 10 years investigating anaesthetics and what they actually are and how they work, which it turns out nobody knows, including anaesthetists. Nobody actually knows how an anaesthetic works or even what unconsciousness actually is, which is a slightly scary thought. But Kate's book is incredibly poetic about this subject that you might expect to be dry and technical. It's a real exploration of what it means to be human and to be aware and to be consciousness and the opposite of that. 
And the other book I'd like to mention, um, which I was one of the judges of the New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards last year, and we gave the Book of the Year Award to, to this book, um, is Kim Scott's Taboo. Kim Scott is one of our preeminent Indigenous authors in Australia. He's a West Australian writer. And in his novel Taboo, he's exploring the legacy of a massacre site where Aboriginal people were massacred by white settlers and the meanings that that site has to both white settler descendants and Indigenous descendants in that part of southwestern Western Australia. It's an extraordinary book that surprises you on every page. He's constantly shifting genre, he's playing with folk tale, with magical realism, with, with historical fiction, with all kinds of different genres, so you never quite know where you are with it. It's, it's one of the most surprising and exciting books I've read in recent years. Okay, thank you for that. Um, a quick taste. Since we've variously mentioned Rowena Gonzalez, you can get a, an early sample of Rowena in this collection here, which was a deliberate attempt to cross the publishing divide. Uh, it is an anthology of writing by Australians of Indian background. Uh, it's actually published by Orient Black Swan in Hyderabad, yay! So you can buy it at the bookstall. Um, there's one story by Rowena, and as we said, she is publishing her whole collection through Speaking Tiger. So that's a nice connection. Uh, so let me just um, go back to some of the specific areas of interest of our speakers today. And maybe for a start, since Anna is running a publishing house, which is relatively new to the scene, I thought it might be useful for her to give some thoughts on how that works in the Australian situation and uh, the kinds of successes and so forth that she's experienced. All right, thank you. Um, I, I wouldn't say that my experience particularly is um, a, a common one, but um, I did a talk yesterday um, in, at the Jaipur about Indies versus Giants and, you know, there's some of the, one of the publishers there, they published 1,500 books a year <laughs> and uh, we publish about seven or eight. So we're very, very small. But the story was really um, to do with my own writing because uh, I'm a writer, I've got a master's and a PhD in creative writing and I'd written a book, you know, spent seven years or something on it and I really wanted to publish it. and. Um, you know, I was shortlisted for a few unpublished manuscript awards and, um, you know, the publishers went, oh, it's, it's great, it's just not for us, which is what you know, publishers do. And it, it's, I can see why, because it's hard to promote. It's set in Sweden where I grew up. It's got five main characters, stories that are connected into a novel. But anyway, one day I had lunch with a really good friend and um, he's an entrepreneur. And he said, why don't we start a publishing company? And I said, because we are not crazy. And um, yeah, we did it anyway, because we are a bit nuts. So, so I did start with literary fiction, because that was my background. And we did start with my book, because obviously we had no idea what we were doing. So I thought, if we're going to make all the mistakes, we might as well make them with my book. And, and we did, we made all the mistakes. And then we kept doing it, because we actually quite enjoyed doing it. And. Um, so literary fiction is still the backbone of the of Midnight Sun, but we were also really, really lucky to early on get a picture book kind of put in our laps. And it was a picture book that we just could not say no to. It, um, it's, it's set in Southeast Asia on the Thai Burma border. And it's about a little boy and his elephant. And uh, one day the elephant strays into the jungle and steps on a landmine and um, she loses her leg and then she gets the prosthetic leg and this is in a picture book and it's done with lino cuts and that are then hand colored so it's just a stunning book and um, yeah the bigger publisher said rejected it and i said I, I cannot reject this book i have to publish it but we had no money to publish picture books are very expensive to print so um, we actually crowdfunded for it 
And that was a really good way of getting the money, but also getting the recognition and getting people interested in the book. So, and then the book went on to actually win an award, the CBCA award, it wasn't on a book in that. And so that just meant it actually became a bestseller and um, we now publish more picture books than literary fiction. But um, I mean, it's, I, I wouldn't recommend to start a publishing company just because it's fun. Like you ha really have to love books, you know, you're not doing it for any other reason. It's just because it's amazing. I mean, I'm here, like it's, it's, it's bringing me all around the world and I, I just love books. Okay, thank you very much. Um, certainly the illustrated children's books are one of our major exports in the publishing scene. And you might have come across people like Man Fox, uh, Where is the Green Sheep? Uh, there's a very famous series, uh, popular everywhere, by Andy Griffith and Terry Denton called, uh, the last one was a 28 story treehouse. Um, so this is, uh, this is a, an active area of, of publication. One of the great things about literary festivals like this is you, you meet people from your own country that you've never met before when you go to places overseas. Um, Anna actually began writing, uh, editing a magazine called Wet Ink, which was a literary journal. I've been using that for some of my research in, in recent times, so it's fantastic. But um, on a different note, um, Mariki, there are various things you might want to talk about, apart from running literary festivals. Um, maybe something about screenwriting. And, well, and what, what do you want to know, Paul? Well, everything. Ask me anything. <laughs> yeah. I'm an open book. Maybe talk about the screenwriting scene well, in Australia. I, I mean, I'd rather chat the monologue. So, okay. I mean, what do you want to know about the screenwriting scene in Australia? Okay, so uh, what, are the, what are the opportunities? You, you were very big on TV <laughs> screenwriting at one point. It's well, I, so I've been a screenwriter for 20 years yeah. and I'm still a working screenwriter as well as um, running the festival. Uh, it's a really exciting time to be a screenwriter, I think, in Australia. The US has really um, been leading the way in that regard in terms of a lot of strong film writers have gone to television the same with actors, and I think that's getting to be the case in Australia too. We don't have the budgets that America does, but there are some really high quality writers and very diverse programming in Australia. So perhaps for the Indian audience where the situation might be a little different, uh, can you say something about the attempt to protect local product, as it were. What do you mean by...? In, in terms of guaranteeing programs on screen that are made in Australia with Australian actors. Well, I mean, a lot of it is to do with funding bodies. And, I mean, I do think Screen Australia and the Australian Writers Guild and the Screen Producers Association, there's a lot of entities that are geared towards protecting and promoting Australian content. And obviously, I think in terms of Australian cinema, I think that's in a bit of a tough place at the moment. I think you get something like Red Dog, which was a hugely successful film and cut through, but for one Red Dog, there's all these other... And The Dressmaker was very successful, but it, I think it's a really hard time for Australian filmmakers now. I think that culture's changing, but I think television is thriving. You get um, shows being sold to the States as well. Okay, thank you. I mean, again, one of the great ironies, perhaps, is... I've seen Marika for many, many months, years on television doing book shows and I get to come here and meet her for the first time. So. I get to be rude to you in person instead that's of just right. rude yeah, on the yeah, television. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but um, just to follow up on one detail, you wrote a, a book with the interesting title of You'll Be Sorry When I'm Dead. Maybe you say something about that. Um, well, it was a collection of, uh, I would say, humorous anecdotal essays I was a huge fan of David Sedaris growing up. I actually wrote him uh, the, es the comedic essays. So I wrote him a fan letter when I was 18 and he wrote back, which was pretty great. Bill Bryson, I wrote a fan letter to him and he wrote back as well. So I've got all those. Uh, and yeah, I think I just, I, I taught myself um, first person writing really through blogging. I really worked on my voice online and got a response with readers and just, did a book with Alan and Unwin, which, which, which was a collection of essays based on things that have happened in my life, really. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to move uh, on to Jane, who, as you heard, is a science writer, amongst many other things. Um, so, can you say a little bit about how things have moved, you know, 
quite often from literature to science writing, where there's perhaps a little more money to be made, maybe. <laughs> Oh, there aren't many areas of writing where there's much money to be made. Uh -huh. um, some people do make a decent living just out of writing, but it's not a very common experience, I don't think, anyway. Um, I feel as though my career has been a series of accidents, really. I, I started out as a journalist. Um, through a series of strange happenings, I found myself at one point working on a doctor's magazine. Um, I thought it was a very odd thing for me to be doing. I have degrees in history and political science, that didn't seem like a good fit, but much to my surprise I discovered it was fascinating and I really loved it. I loved going into work every day and having no idea what I was going to have to get my head around and what expert I might have to interview about it and what kinds of questions I might have to come up with so that the expert didn't think I was a total idiot when I rang them. And so from there I've moved on into making science my beat, I guess. Um, for a while I worked as a popular science book publisher um, and I've gone on to found the festival of writing about science which is very deliberately designed to bring unexpected people and ideas together into the same space. So, for example, at, at the last festival I had a panel about writing the universe where I had an astronomer, a poet and an indigenous storyteller all talking about different ways of understanding the universe. So it's perhaps not exactly what people would think about when you talk about a science writing festival. I like to surprise people, including the people on the panel, and to have interesting conversations that actually wouldn't happen anywhere else because these people wouldn't meet each other anywhere else. Yeah, okay. Thanks. I mean, one of the other things you're involved in is the what used to be the Sydney Writers' Centre, Centre now writing New South Wales, yeah? Um, I might be of interest to people to know the kinds of infrastructure that are available in, in a centre like that? Yeah. Well, Australia is very fortunate in that it has a network of, of writer centres under various names, and the one that I run is called Writing New South Wales. So it services the state of New South Wales, of which Sydney is the capital. And in each state or, or territory of Australia, there is an organisation like this that is designed to support writers. So we run a range of courses for writers, professional development for writers, we do advocacy for writers, we have a program of small grants for writers and emerging writing organisations, which we hand out. Uh, we run festivals and events. We do, we run publications, we give advice. We, ha we have a whole range of different services that we provide to writers. And I think it's, it, we look after writers at all stages of their careers and from all genres, from journalism, playwriting, poetry, screenwriting, no matter. Um, but I guess we do have probably the most impact early on in writers' careers when they most need that kind of support and the, the feeling of community with other writers who, who they can get that kind of peer support from. And I, we have had a big impact, as have the centres in other states, in developing writers' careers very early on in their career. Okay, thank you. Uh, one, one of the uh, ways in which writers do get to survive as writers, uh, as writers is by uh, government support, uh, largely through literary prizes. And over the last, I guess, 20 years, there's been a proliferation of, of literary awards in Australia. Um, so I wonder whether you have any thoughts on how the system works, is it working well? What? We, we have a lot of literary prizes compared to most other countries that I'm aware of. I mean, we have a lot more money available through literary prizes than, say, the UK does. Um, and lots of prizes in all kinds of different genres or for writers of different ages. We're, we're actually very fortunate there. and. Each of the states has its own Premier's Awards. So I mentioned that I judged the New South Wales Awards, but there are equivalent awards in every other state of Australia as well. And they're mostly open to people from anywhere in the country. So, and it's surprising, I find, every year when you look at the prize winners to see how little overlap there is. There's often overlap in shortlists, but it's rare for the same book to be winning the prize in, in multiple states which actually means the money's being shared around really nicely between lots of different writers, which is just great. And it is hard for writers to make a living these days, so those prizes really do add an element to a writer's working life. Yeah, I mean, that raises the interesting idea, the difference from one prize to another, about regional difference, um, which leads me to think of one book we haven't mentioned, which I really wanted to, to mention, 
as I think really important, but it, it's also interesting because it comes from a very small regional press up in the northwest of Australia, specifically for Aboriginal uh, writers. And this is a book by Bruce Pascoe called Dark Emu. It's not fiction, it's uh, an exploration of the myths about Aboriginal culture by white settler through the, through the official history of the nation, if you like. Um, correcting myths that the Aborigines were simply wandering around the country not doing very much. And he does point out at great, great length and in great detail uh, how people farmed in ways that Europeans couldn't recognise perhaps, how they had architecture of fish traps particularly and, and homes, dwellings and stone dwellings in the south and so forth. So it kind of rewrites the way Australians have been thinking about our past. Uh, and again, it's interesting because it comes from that very small regional but, but very influential location. I couldn't agree more about that book, and I actually would have nominated it, but I thought it was outside the time frame, because <laughs> you said a book from the last year. Okay, sorry. Yeah. We, we, we actually gave that the Premier's Book of the Year Award three uh -huh. years ago, right. and it had, it had been published and had, had very little attention, actually, and when it won the Book of the Year Award, it became an overnight bestseller, mm -hmm. and it has bankrolled that small Indigenous publishing house. Um, for the years since, yeah. so yeah, it's yeah. allowing them to do more. It's a completely brilliant book, mm -hmm. as you as you said. It overturns our, our received history of Australian history, and it does it by using white Australian documents. Sure. Bruce yeah. did, did a, yeah. an amazing research job where he combed through the diaries of early settlers and explorers, and from them found an enormous volume of evidence for Indigenous agriculture in Australia which we were all taught at school didn't exist. We were taught Aboriginal people were hunter-gatherers, they didn't farm the land, they didn't have specific, they didn't have settled homes. He's found from the white documents evidence of villages, of farms, of huge areas of cultivated land. It's an absolute game changer in Australian history. Yeah, thanks. Um, just moving back to, to Anna, um, and again, brave projects. Uh, one, once, at one stage in the Australian literary publishing history, you would get a prize, A, if you were an Australian citizen, and B, if your book was about something recognisably Australian. And if it wasn't, you would be declared um, illegible. That's you know, gladly changing, and uh, there's still a lot, obviously a large market for things that do concentrate on Australia, and Anna was very brave in producing a novel that was actually about Sweden. So maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about that. No, I'm not sure that that is so interesting for you. I mean, it's many years ago and yep, it was, it was just my PhD novel. So I wanted to explore different ways of writing. So that it's really quite experimental. Um, I mean, you won't be able to find it here. Um, but what I really thought was fun was I wanted to write short stories that could get published along the way and put them together so that if you read them, they become a novel. So, you know, you follow the same thing, five people. And um, one thing that, I mean, you know, I still like it when I look back at that book and go, yeah, that's a, that was a good idea. As I have little interludes in between chapters and they're written in second person. So it's basically about you. So the reader is in the book, but it's also about the city where it, uh, the book is set, which is the city where I grew up, but I no longer lived in. So, and I mean, I know it's, it's the same here in India. Um, people move around a lot. And in Australia, people move around a lot. And you don't necessarily live in the same place where you grew up. So it was, you know, in a way, it's a bit of a nostalgic look. But what I wanted to um, respond to earlier is about um, awards in Australia and I, I mean I think it's great that there are so many um, but and it's great that Bruce Pascoe's book has done so well but generally there's really only three awards that actually sell a lot of books which is the Miles Franklin, the Stella Price and the CBCA which is for children's books so um, yeah some of the other awards even though they're large and they're premiers awards they don't necessarily sell a lot of books so for a publisher it's it's great that you know if your author wins the prize but it's not necessarily actually gonna you know help you sell many books unfortunately 
Okay, just uh, to pick up on the Stella Prize, um, one of the themes of the conference so far has been very much centred on, on women, um, and the Stella Prize is specifically for women writers, unless I'm wrong. It is, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> good. <laughs> and uh, I, I noticed that uh, Marika has, I think, a series of books now on women of letters. Do you want to talk a bit about that, please? Uh, women of Letters was a spoken word, spoken word, live spoken word event I co-curated and co-produced with Michaela Maguire, who now actually runs the Sydney Writers' Festival. Uh, and we ran that event for seven years, and it was basically five prominent women would give them a letter topic, a letter to a subject, so they'd write and read a new piece, a letter to the night I'd rather forget, a letter to my turning point, all these different ones. And we toured the show for seven years monthly events in Melbourne and then across Australia and then we toured it across the States, New Zealand, Indonesia, UK and Ireland which was basically just the two of us putting this on. All the money went to an animal rescue shelter in country Victoria. Um, we raised over a million dollars for this animal rescue shelter and Penguin published seven um, collections of all the letters from the events. So, you know, that's something that I'm very proud of in my life. It was a really beautiful event. We never recorded it because we wanted to give the writers a space to have their own moments of catharsis and connect with the audience. We didn't want to exploit them if they were writing something new. So it was all these things that existed just in that room at that time and it was really beautiful. Great, thank you. Um, I think it's about time we opened up for questions. I'm getting the five minute sign, so questions, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, so since we have a lot of uh, talk about publishing and publishing houses, one question that really popped up to me was about, the, I mean you talked about uh, how you gradu graduated into publishing, you know you went to uh, publishers and the thing is they not every time they show faith in your work because of the sheer volume of uh, material that uh, go goes out to them. So, uh, what's your take on uh, self-publishing? Because in India, it's kind of gaining prominence. Uh, so, self-publishing and uh, the ways in which you can address the uh, problem. Uh, I mean, look, it's a very interesting question, and because I, I mean, I suppose in a way you could say that I self-published, but I, I just, I decided to, you know, have that distance. So, you know, I started a publishing company with all, and um, I think. One of the issues with self-publishing, and I, I think a lot of people who are self-published struggle a lot with this, is distribution, because it's very hard to get into bookshops if you aren't published by a publisher. Um, so you basically have to go around and say, can you do this on consignment? And you know, and it, it's hard for the bookshops to keep track of it. But um, in Australia, anyway, they're usually quite nice if you're a first-time author and you go and talk to them. Um, but another problem that self-publishing has, I think, is that they don't necessarily spend enough time on um, editorial work. You know, they don't get a professional editor to edit it before it comes out, um, and they don't necessarily get a professional designer to design the cover. So often the books look very self-published, which obviously isn't going to help them when they, you know, to reach readers that they want. Um, so those are the main issues, I think. We work with a lot of writers who, who do go down that road um, and I think it's really important if you're going to self-publish to think of it as, as taking on a business. You, you are taking on the business of publishing your work and as Anna said, you have to get it edited. You can't do it yourself, your best friend can't do it for you. You've got to have it professionally edited, you need a professionally designed cover, you need a marketing plan. You have to think through all those things and do it professionally. But on a positive note, I would say that the attitude to self-published books has changed a lot in the, in the last 10 years or so, whereas they used to be thought, you know, it used to be called vanity publishing and nobody took it seriously. There are now some really prominent writers choosing to go down that path and it's no longer automatically thought of as an inferior way to do it. Yeah, and in Australia it's also shifted so now self-published authors can submit to some of the awards which never used to be the case. So it is definitely shifting a bit. Yeah, and I guess you can add to that the number of people who are starting to blog their work. Yeah. Question, is that a question in the back or somebody stretching? <laughs> I think it's, any other questions? Yes, over here. 
Sir, in Australia, uh, e-publications are more or or as book like normal book, which are more consuming. most publishers publish all their books as ebooks as well. Uh, we never publish just as ebook, we always publish a hard copy and an ebook of all the um, from middle grade which is like eight to twelve year old to YA to adult. They're all in both formats. And um, but what is coming a lot in Australia is the audio book. And so more and more books are now being made into audio books as well. Okay, two questions. Uh, wow. I, I wanted to ask uh, what the transition is like if you are used to writing in first person or second person and then writing a screenplay, uh, a script as such. How is the transition? How do you adapt to not being able to describe everything from your own perspective? How you have, you have to put yourself in every, everybody's shoes and write what they think, right? So it's not your opinion anymore. How is the transition like? That's a really interesting question. Uh, I, w I think I was screenwriting before I was first person writing, even though, you know, I grew up writing as we all do. I wrote stories, I wrote my diary, so it's just when you're a writer, it it's just happens. So screenwriting, when I first started, it is a, the way of writing you have to get used to. You, I did learn on the job. I was writing for a television show and I would do monologues of people talking and they said that's how people talk in real life but not on television in television you've got to break up the sentences and then you put a line of big print which is describing what's happening and that's a real joy you get to know the characters and and what's inside their head and plotting it i'm writing a play at the moment and i have never written a play before and i'm finding that really hard like television fine but with play i feel really awkward like i, I don't know how to write a play this feels really strange so i think it's just getting used to it and practicing over and over and I think screenwriting it does help to work to read scripts if you're trying to learn how to be a screenwriter read other people's scripts there are so many of favorite films and TV shows online and it really shows you that dialogue I mean you know the characters if you're creating them it's just a helpful guide I think okay we have time for one last question um, my question is directed to all of you what are the major themes that Australian writers use to cater to the interests of Australian leaders specifically? Uh, that, I mean, that's a big question and the beautiful thing, I guess, is that it's, there's a, readers with really wide tastes in Australia just as much Australians writing about lots of things. Sometimes when there's been, uh, this year it's the 10 year anniversary of a big, something called the Black Saturday fires, which were big bushfires in Victoria. And I've noticed the publishers are publishing a lot of books related to that. There's a lot of interesting non-fiction about politics that sells very well. Uh, I think memoir sells quite well in Australia, depending on the person. But I mean, thankfully readers read everything I think in Australia, so yeah. Yeah, and like everywhere, people love reading about personal relationships and romantic relationships. Those things are always very popular. Um, good speculative fiction is popular. I think there's a lot of writing, both fiction and non-fiction, around climate change and threats to the environment. So a lot of speculative fiction now is focusing on climate dystopias and environmental challenges. Um, I do think Australia, a very particular thing about Australia is that we are grappling with the legacy of colonialism and reconciliation with the First Nations between the settler descendants and the First Nations people. And there's a lot of very interesting literature coming out on both sides of that, um, in both fiction and non-fiction. I mean, we've mentioned Bruce Pascoe's book, which was a very important book, but there, and I mentioned Kim Taboo's novel, uh, Kim Scott's novel Taboo as well. Um, but there's a lot more, I think, in that. And another thing too is that Australia is a very multicultural nation as India is, but much more formed by migration than, than India. And there are some really exciting new voices coming out of some of the very many diverse communities in Australia as well. Yeah, I mean, in terms of um, children's publishing, which is their main area that we work in at the moment, and I mean, we, at least we try to also kind of show the diversity of the 
of experience of um, Australians and new Australians and, and people with um, disabilities, you know, like um, someone with a left leg or someone who's who got a book about um, someone who's deaf. And so I, I think it's important to show the diversity of, of uh, you know, Australians, basically. The question was relating to colonialism and, and does it still survive in, in literary treatments of it? Um, <laughs> is the quick answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, as Jane said, the dominant culture is that Anglo settler culture, which is still confronting histories that haven't been told, histories that nobody wants to know. Uh, in order to reach a point where there might be some reconciliation with the original inhabitants. So yes, in that sense, it's going on. Um, it, it then gets translated into other modes of power struggles across the multicultural, you know, majority-minority kind of cultural politics whose voice can be heard. So in that sense, yes. Um, so look, thank you for your question and thank you all for coming. We do have to finish up for the next round. Please thank our panelists.